is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. Everyone who has visited or even been brought up in a Protestant church has heard the term prayer of salvation. This is a prayer that many believe one has to say in order to be saved. This belief is normally based off of Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is a verse that is taken out of context more often than not in many church settings today. In Romans 10, Paul expounds on the law of God, calling it the law of righteousness, and it's the righteousness that is by faith. <laughs> Let me say that again. In Romans 10, Paul expounds on the law of God, calling it the law of righteousness, and says it's the righteousness that is by faith. However, as Peter warned, Paul's words have been taken out of context by many and distorted. So, let's review the whole chapter of Romans chapter 10 to gain understanding to the true meaning of verse 9. Starting in verse 1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Now, first, he addresses the readers as brothers, letting us know the readers of this letter are already believers. We find in chapter 7 that these believers also knew the Torah. We see in verse 1 how he declares his desire and prayer for physical Israel is their salvation. Now, verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Paul is saying their zeal is not based on the knowledge the Father has given them, that being the law, the Torah, the true foundation of knowledge. Now, are there any scriptures that would show Torah is the knowledge Paul is talking about? There are a few. So, let's briefly hit pause here on Romans chapter 10 for just a few minutes and examine this point on what the knowledge is that Paul is talking about here. First, Proverbs chapter 1. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, if the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, biblically speaking, what does it mean to fear Yahweh? Deuteronomy chapter 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws Yahweh your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear Yahweh your God. So, looking at this verse, the Torah was given so we can walk in the fear of Yahweh. So, walking in obedience to the Torah is showing our fear of Yahweh. So, one who fears Yahweh is one who obeys the Torah Yahweh gave. Thus, the biblical definition of knowledge that Paul is speaking of here in Romans chapter 10 is to fear Yahweh and to fear Yahweh is to obey his commands as given in Deuteronomy. Paul is saying their zeal is not based on the knowledge Yahweh had given them. It wasn't based on the Torah, the true foundation of knowledge. This becomes more evident in the following verses. Verse 3, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So, what is the righteousness of God they didn't submit to? Deuteronomy chapter 6. And if we are careful to obey all this law before Yahweh our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. This is exactly what Yeshua himself said the Pharisees and teachers of the law did. 
they clung to what was passed down to them instead of the Word of God. Mark chapter 7. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold on to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your own tradition. Then he quotes the Torah written by Moses in verse 10. He then shows how they ignore what was written. And in verse 13, he shows what was written by Moses is the word of God, but they followed their traditions instead. So they made and followed their own righteousness instead of holding to what the word declares is righteousness, that being the Torah. So obedience to the law is the righteousness that Yahweh desires us to live out. Now, some may quickly say, well, that was the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. In response to that, please remember that Yeshua corrected the Pharisees for not following the Torah. So, does the New Testament ever equate the law for our righteousness? Well, a little later we will see this very chapter calls the law the righteousness that is by faith. The faith that we are to walk by. But we'll cover that in a moment. Here are some other verses, though. Romans chapter 2, verse 13. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Now, regarding 1 John 3, 7, biblically speaking, what does it mean here to do what is right? Well, in keeping with biblical definitions, doing what is right is obeying the commands of Yahweh according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, and Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28. If one still doesn't want to believe this is what 1 John 3, 7 is referring to, it must be noted that 1 John speaks much about obedience to the law. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3-6. through 6. Now regarding this verse, how did Yeshua walk? He walked in obedience to the law. Then we have 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. We have a whole teaching on this verse simply titled, What is Sin? Then we have 1 John chapter 3, verses 22-24. through 24. And then we have 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. So, the righteousness we are to seek is God's righteousness. Can you think of a verse where Yeshua himself said this? Well, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the exact same Greek word for righteousness as Paul uses here in verse 3. Now, speaking of which, let's read it again to refresh where we're at in Romans chapter 10. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The problem back then and today is that man tries to make his own righteousness, his own good deeds. More often than not, it comes from the previous church fathers. This is what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did. They were going on what was passed down to them instead of going on what the Word of God said. For more on that topic, with the Pharisees that is, please see our teaching Don't be a Judaizer. We forget the Lord declares our righteousness as filthy rags through Isaiah. Yet, this is what Israel was doing. They were substituting their righteousness for God's righteousness. And this is what Paul is talking about here in verse 3. Israel had completely set aside the law given to them and focused on the traditions passed down to them. They set aside his righteousness for their own righteousness. Paul continues on track with this topic in verse 4. 
For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is where the church begins to misrepresent Paul as warned by Peter. They use this verse to say that Paul is saying that Yeshua did away with the law, saying that Yeshua brought it to an end, thus saying he is the end of the law. However, if this is the case, then Paul himself is contradicting the very words of Yeshua. For Yeshua said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law, until all is accomplished. For a further study on this, please see our teaching titled, Abolished. But remember this phrase, until heaven and earth pass away. We'll come back to that a little later. Here in verse 4, Paul is saying Yeshua is the end of the law, similar to how the end zone in the game of football is the end of the football field. Meaning, he is the goal of the law. He is the living example of that which we are to strive for. Just as Revelation is the end of the Bible, Yeshua is the end of the law. And just as Revelation didn't do away with the rest of Scripture, Yeshua didn't do away with the law either. This is the word for end in the Greek. Now, there is no doubt the word means end. However, it is often overlooked that it also carries the meaning of end by way of being the goal. This exact same word is also found here in John chapter 13, verse 1. So, does it mean the end of his love or the fullness of his love? It's also found here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. So, is it the end of the command or is it the goal of the command? It's also found here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. So, is it the end of their faith or is it the goal of their faith? As you can see, this word can definitely carry the meaning of goal and not bringing something to an end. This will make more sense in a moment because of how the verses following verse 4 shows the exact opposite of what the church claims Paul is talking about. The next verse is where Paul starts showing the law is alive and well. Romans 10.5 For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. Live by that righteousness. Live is a verb, simply meaning to do, put into action, to actually live out that righteousness. We can't ignore the righteousness that Paul is speaking of here is the righteousness Moses wrote. Paul is speaking of the same righteousness referred to in verse 3. The Pharisees and teachers of the law may have been preaching the righteousness of God, the law, but they were only reading it. After that, they followed and pursued their own laws. They weren't living the Torah. They weren't doing it. They weren't putting it into practice, as Paul says here in verse 5. Yeshua told his disciples this very same thing regarding the Pharisees. Yahweh desires us to live the law. His righteousness from our heart, from an inward desire to love God and not just obey it out of duty. Verse 5 here is where Paul is expounding on a quote from Leviticus chapter 18. It says, Keep my decrees and laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am Yahweh. This was the very righteousness of God that they were supposed to be living. The same righteousness that Yeshua said we should seek. The righteousness of God that was given through Moses. Next, in verse 6, we find Paul quoting from Deuteronomy. Now, 
Before we read Paul's words in verse 6, let's look at the verses he actually quotes from in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. These verses are referencing the law that Moses gave. Now, let's read from Paul in verses 6 through 8. And as we do, please remember these verses in Deuteronomy. Paul quotes from these verses in Deuteronomy regarding God's law. Not man's law, or even a supposed new law from God given in the New Testament. Now, it must be noted that the Greek of the first word given in the next verse is day. It's a conjunction that simply means and, but, or now, pending the interpreter's view. Any interpreter who believes the law has been done away with will be more apt to separate the righteousness mentioned in the quote of Leviticus that Paul gave us in verse 5 from the righteousness that is by faith as mentioned in verse 6. But you are about to see these verses are referring to the exact same righteousness that comes from the law. The exact same. Now, in reading Paul's quote from Deuteronomy, we're going to show you the Greek words with their meanings, where the interpreters place the word but. We're showing you this to let you decide which matches the context best. So, here's Paul's quote starting in verse 6. And remember, you'll see the Greek in several words. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy regarding the law the law of righteousness that is by faith. He declares it right here. The word of faith that Paul was proclaiming was the law. This should make complete sense because Yeshua is the word made flesh. This text proves that verses 5 and 6 are speaking of the same law and should be referenced as such. But many try to separate them. The word day should not be interpreted as but. It should be interpreted as and or now, meaning the law that is mentioned in verses 4 and 5 is the exact same law that's being referenced here in verses 6 through 8. Paul is not giving a distinction. He's showing it's all the same. When we try to separate these verses from referring to the same law that Moses gave, we bring confusion and are forced to create a new law that simply doesn't exist. Many at this point will refer to the book of Philippians, specifically chapter 3, verse 9, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. First, the Greek doesn't say the law. The Greek simply says law, leaving the context to show which law is being spoken of, which is man's law established in verse 6 in this same chapter. So let's read verses 3 through 6. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although 
I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I have far more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. This is the law where he said he was blameless or faultless. Yet, we know Paul said all have sinned and fall short regarding God's law. This verse establishes the fact that no one can be blameless in God's law but Yeshua alone. Yet, one could be perfect to man's law, as was Paul's testimony to the Philippians here in chapter 3. And remember, these verses show Paul was a Pharisee. We already established the fact that the Pharisees didn't follow the Torah. They followed their own law passed down to them. This law later became known as the Talmud. It was those very things that Paul considered a loss compared to knowing Christ in verse 7 and longed for the righteousness from God which is based on faith as mentioned in verse 9. Now, regarding this righteousness that's by faith, let's now go back to Romans chapter 10 and review the last few verses again and continue on from where we were. Chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. And now continuing to the next part, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Remember, Paul is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30 here. This is what was said regarding the law, the righteousness that is by faith. The word of faith that Paul was proclaiming was the law, not man's law, but God's law. And we must remember, Paul is talking to believers here as mentioned in verse 1. So, he's not talking about conversion here. He's talking about the salvation that comes to believers at the second coming. Now, how do we know this? Well, let's briefly look four verses down at verse 13. Verse 13 is a quote from Joel chapter 2, Verse 32, it says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, let's look at Joel 2.32 along with the previous verse for the context of what Paul is quoting here. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, among the survivors whom Yahweh calls. So the context that Paul is talking about is all about being saved at the second coming. So then, just what is Romans 10.9 saying to us? Let's look at it again. Romans 10.9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 9 follows the quote from Deuteronomy regarding the righteousness that is by faith, the law. Paul is revealing to us the mystery of how Yeshua is the living law, by way of being the living word. The Torah is the word, and Yeshua is the word. Yeshua also said, that he was life. John 14, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, are there other definitions of life in the scriptures? 
Deuteronomy chapter 30. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, let's pause for a moment here. Earlier in this teaching, I referred to a phrase and asked you to remember it. Do you remember what it was? It was from Matthew chapter 5, where Yeshua said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So why would Yeshua say this? Because as given here in Deuteronomy, heaven and earth are the witnesses to the law being established until the new heaven and new earth. For more on this, please see our teaching, Heaven and Earth Testify. Now, let's read all that verse and then we'll continue on with our definitions of life. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love Yahweh your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For Yahweh is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, God is declared as life. So, biblically speaking, Yeshua is life and God is life. What other definitions of life do we have? Well, consider just a couple chapters later. Deuteronomy chapter 32. He said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So now we see the law is declared life. Yeshua, Yahweh, and the law are all defined as life in the scriptures. When you accept Yeshua, you accept life. Thus, you're accepting Yahweh and the law, the Torah. They're completely synonymous with each other. This is being born again because you are proclaiming Yeshua, who is and gives the living law, the Torah, the righteousness of Yahweh. So, That which is life gives life. Living the law is not your salvation, though. Let me say that again. Living the law is not your salvation. Living the law is evidence of your salvation. Faith is the root, and obedience is the fruit. This is nothing new, just true. Does this sound foreign to you? Allow me to remind you where your salvation comes from. 1 Peter chapter 1 For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. It's not the changing Word of God or even partial Word of God. It's the enduring Word of God. Again, Living the law is not your salvation. Living the law is the evidence of your salvation. Because that which is in you, Yeshua, the living law, will come out of you. Consider also John chapter 15. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So it was the word that made them clean, just as we see with 1 Peter. Again, the word that is in you will come out of you. The word is the seed, as 1 Peter said. This parallels the parable of the sower where Yeshua said, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. 
And it's this word that is to be planted in our hearts. If you plant an apple seed, you get an apple tree. When you plant the word, Yeshua, the living law, in you, you get the word, Yeshua, the living law, out of you. Like kind produces like kind. That's why we also read this. 1 John chapter 2. Whoever claims to live in him must also walk as Jesus did. And how did he walk? According to the Torah. Now let's continue with Romans chapter 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Ever heard the phrase, the proof is in the pudding? (laughs) This is exactly what Paul is saying. He knows when one truly has the word in his heart that it will come out of his mouth and then the rest will follow. It's a direct referral to Deuteronomy chapter 30. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. Notice how it's to be in our mouth and heart so we obey it. Yeshua himself said in Luke 6.45, The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. When the word is truly in you, it will come out of you, showing forth that living the law is fruit of your salvation. We must remember that it's to be in our heart and in our mouth. There are many examples where it came out of the mouths simply for show, but it wasn't truly in the heart. Thus, obedience didn't follow. True obedience starts in the heart and works its way out. This is why Deuteronomy chapter 30 says it is to be in our mouth and in our heart. Paul then continues in Romans chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Now, is this something new? Of course not. Numbers chapter 15. The community is to have the same rules for you and for the alien living among you. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You and the alien shall be the same before Yahweh. Now, back to Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As mentioned earlier, this is a direct referral to Joel chapter 2, regarding the return of Yeshua. Now, verses 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news! Good news about what? This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Isaiah 52, verse 8 shows the topic here is the Lord's return to Zion. Again, it's the topic of his second coming. This is where Paul is quoting from. Continuing on in Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So, was faith required back then? (laughs) Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 specifically tells us that it was the lack of faith that kept the first generation under Moses out of the promised land. Think about that for a moment. The lack of faith kept them out of the promised land. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 14. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, 
Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Please notice that unbelief is equated here with disobedience to the law. So how is this the case? Because one who believes and confesses is one who walks in obedience. Obedience is evidence of one's faith. Again, faith is the root and obedience is the fruit. If the seed is in you, it will grow out from you. In this case, there was no faith. Thus, there was no obedience. Speaking of those under Moses, that first generation. So, was faith required back then? Yes, absolutely. Faith has always been required of the Father. It's not a New Testament thing. Consider even these words of Paul just three verses before Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, works of man, not God. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Please note, faith was the stumbling stone. They thought it was by works, again, meaning their works, like that which the Pharisees followed from that what was passed down to them. Continuing on, Romans 9.33 just as it was written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. The righteousness that the Father established was and is to be pursued in faith. It always has been. Now, back to our context of Hebrews chapter 3, but continuing on, into chapter 4, Hebrews 4, starting at verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. First, please notice that we have had the same gospel given to us just as they did under Moses. Yet, they did not combine faith and obedience with what they heard. What did they hear? The law, the Torah. Again, showing that faith was required even back then. <laughs> now, on that note, Let's continue on with our text in Romans. Verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice was gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Whose voice has gone out? This is a quote from Psalms 19.4. The context in this psalm is the heavens declaring the glory of God. Why is this of any significance? Because this is regarding the witnesses, heaven and earth, declaring God's law until a new heaven and new earth. Continuing on, Romans 10.19 Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry 
by a nation that has no understanding. Why would Israel be envious or even angry at another nation or people? Only because those people are following Yahweh according to the ways he gave to Israel first. Many strict and orthodox Jews get upset when they see Gentiles pursue the Torah. They're quick to say that Gentiles only have to follow what they call the Noahide laws. But they're quick to omit Numbers chapter 15. It says, For the generations to come, whenever an alien or anyone else living among you presents an offering made by fire as an aroma pleasing to Yahweh, he must do exactly as you do. The community is to have the same rules for you and for the alien living among you. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You and the alien shall be the same before Yahweh. The same laws and regulations will apply both to you and the alien living among you. Regarding how many Jews get upset when they see Gentiles pursue the Torah, please see our teaching, Anger and Jealousy. Continuing on, verse 20, And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. This was the whole purpose of Paul's journeys, to spread the good news to the Gentiles, the nations. They didn't ask for it, but it was being declared to them just the same. And concluding, Romans 10.21, But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Disobedient to what? The law. So, does he do away with the law so they won't be disobedient anymore? Not at all. The very ones who rejected Yeshua at his first coming were the very ones who rejected the law and were following their own laws and traditions. That thought alone concerns me for those who reject the Torah today. In conclusion, Romans 10.9 is not about conversion or a prayer of salvation. It's all about living the life of God's righteousness. It's all about walking in obedience to His Torah, the eternal Word, through faith in Yeshua as we wait for His glorious salvation at His return. Well, that's all I have. Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.